We are live. Welcome to Expedition Church of the Triad for our Wednesday evening service. I trust everybody is having a great day, even though it's cloudy and gray outside. I managed to miss my turn coming tonight. <laughs> I took a little detour and went off, had a turn and come back. So I got here a little later than I planned, but that's okay. Got here anyway. Praise the Lord. So we're going to, uh, I think we're going to receive the offering at the end of the service tonight. We'll just go ahead and get into the Word. So before we do that, let's open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come and receive from your Word. We thank you, Father, that your Word is our guide, our uh, textbook. And so, Father, the Holy Spirit, as the teacher of the church, we give him free reign tonight to say and do anything that he wants to do. We thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, let's let's consider a few things here tonight. You know, the world is telling us that we Christians just need to be more open-minded. And, uh, you know, just just take, take a step back and just be open-minded and look at the world and uh, take the world as it is and so forth. We hear that all the time. So tonight, um, I've got a message that we're entitling, Become Narrow-Minded. <laughs> Goes against the grain of the world a bit. But uh, in order to set this up, uh, let me give you a little bit of background. Pastor was teaching uh, on uh, or from Isaiah 55, and he was talking about how God's thoughts are not our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. And uh, as I was meditating on that, I started a radio program. Uh, I think it was like Friday of last week I started this topic. And uh, in the process of discussing it, I said something that I went, what? <laughs> and that happens to me quite a bit when I'm teaching. I'll say something and I'll go, what did that mean? And I have to go back and study it out and find out where did that come from? Well, it came up out of my spirit, but where did it come from? And so I made the statement. And I'll let you see what you can make of it. I made the statement as I was teaching on the radio. We need to stay in a constant state of repentance. And I went, what? <laughs> what does that mean? And so I, I meditated on that and I said, now, I kind of know what, we, what direction we're going in here, but I need a little more direction on that, what, what that means. Because it sounds like, see, the thing is, we've got all of this training from our background about repentance and what it is. We think we repent, we get born again, we're done with repenting. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Word of faith circles. We don't talk much about repentance. And uh, so stay in a constant state of repentance. I thought, I don't know about that. Because, I mean, I know that once we're born again, when, you know, we receive Jesus as Lord, we're born again then we become, we are made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So it almost sounds like, if you say stay in a constant state of repentance, it almost sounds like uh, sin consciousness. And you know, there was just something inside me that just reared up and said, oh, now, 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 hold on. <laughs> but you see, that's not the direction that my teaching was going at the time when I said it. And as I studied it out, I said, oh, okay, I think I know where we're headed with this. So let's look at this, and in studying it out, we're going to make some propositions. Now, a proposition is where you state a case, and then you back it up. We're going to state five propositions. The first one is, we, talking about all of us as believers, we are a spirit, we have a soul, and we live in a body. That's proposition number one. All right? And to back that up, let's look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, where it says, And the very God of peace sanctify, the word sanctify means set apart for holy use, sanctify you wholly. Now that's W-H-O-L-L-Y, not H-O-L-Y, you know, sanctify you wholly. When you say it, it sounds like you're talking about holiness, uh, and certainly holiness is good, uh, but... Here we're talking about the whole man, all of you. You are a spirit, you have a soul, you live in a body. So let's keep reading. Sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body 
be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we've taken this part before, pastors taught on this before, but you are a spirit. The real you, the you that you, is a spirit being. And that spirit being is made out of spirit stuff. <laughs> Amen? It's not physical. Uh, it's spirit, and that word is pneuma in the Greek. And the word pneuma, in, it's interesting in translating it, it actually means breath. And there's a Hebrew word that's real similar to it that is rausch. And when you say it, rausch, you can hear the breath. So when, when God breathed the breath of life into Adam, he was made a living soul, or we would say spirit, a spirit man. Then soul is suke in the Greek. That's where we get the word psychology. It's the mind, the will, and the emotions. So let's think about that. You are a spirit. You possess, you have a mind, will, and emotions. You live in a physical body, which is soma in the Greek. And that just means what you would expect, this physical body that we live in. Charles Capps used to say you can't live on earth without an earth suit. Well, your spirit man wears this earth suit, in order to function. When I pick something up, I have to use my body, my muscles, my bones, and so forth to pick up an object. Well, that's because my spirit can't directly interact with this physical thing, but my body can. So I am a spirit, I have a soul, I live in a body. So that's prep preposition number one, proposition number one. Now, proposition number two, God is always right. <laughs> I don't think we get much argument from most folks on that. God is always right. Well, let's back up and get some scriptural basis for that. Psalm 99, 9b, meaning the latter part of that verse, says, The Lord our God is holy. Now, here it is, H-O-L-Y. The Lord our God is holy. God is holy. Then uh, Malachi 3, 6a, first part of the verse, says, For I am the Lord, and I change not. So he's holy, and he doesn't change. Well, what does that tell you about God? He doesn't make mistakes. He doesn't get confused. He doesn't have uh, bad ideas and have to change his mind about what he's thinking. He's right, because he's God. Uh, Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Well, that takes care of all areas of time. Yesterday is the past. Today is the present. Forever is the future. So Jesus is the same. He doesn't change. He is the Lord. He changes not. He is the Lord and He is holy. Okay? So He's not going to change. Well, our proposition here is God is always right. He's not only always right. There's nobody higher than him to tell him to go a different direction. Now, you got that wrong, God. No, no, no. God is God. He is right. Okay. Proposition number three. Repentance means change. Now, I grew up Southern Baptist, and we were told that repentance means to change direction. It means you're walking one way, and you turn around, and you walk the other way. Well, that's very simplistic in terms of what it means. The Greek word is, boy, and I'm going to try to pronounce this. Bear with me. Met an O and O. You try it. <laughs> anyway, it basically means, now let's listen to the definition from Strong's, to think differently. To think differently. Or afterwards, that is, reconsider morally to feel compunction or to repent, which is the word, of course, we use. It's used 34 times in the King James Version. Now, this word, which I'm not going to try to pronounce again, repentance, means more than just changing direction. It really means to change your mind as much as anything. To go a different direction, to think a different way, to... And think about the very verse of Scripture that we originally started with, was Pastor Teach it on Isaiah 55, my thoughts are not your thoughts. My ways are not my way, uh, your ways. So his thoughts are different than ours. And I'm talking about when I say ours, 
I'm talking about mankind, generally, okay? Uh, not Christians that have their mind renewed to the Word, just people. His thoughts are very different than people's thoughts. And they are higher. Goes back to the thing about God is always right. God is holy. So, again, you don't teach God, okay? We don't presume to teach Him. But He is more than happy to teach us. And He's more than happy to give us every, uh, you know, pro uh, ability to be taught. That is, the Holy Spirit, the teacher of the church, the Word of God, our textbook, like I said earlier. Uh, all of that is put in place to teach us. And really, if you keep reading there in Isaiah 55, it says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than, than your ways. However, he said, but my word will not return unto me void, but it will prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it. So his word, when it goes forth, we pick it up and we put it in our mouth, we speak it out, and it will not return to him void. The word void there means powerless. So when we return God's word to him, which how do we do that? You know, uh, one time I was, I was teaching and I had my Bible in my hand and the Lord said, do you throw your Bible up in the air and you return it to him that way? No, it falls right back down in your hands, doesn't it? You, that doesn't return God's word to him. He said, the way you return my word to me is by speaking it. He spoke his word. We have record of it. We put it in our mouth. We speak it, and that returns it to him. But when it returns to him, it doesn't return to him powerless. It returns to him empowered with the word that you chose to return to him. So if I return God's word concerning healing, then the power of God is present to cause that word to come to pass in my life, and healing begins to manifest. So that's how we operate in this system. So the thing is, repentance means change. Uh, Mark 1, 2 says, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And that word repent is that word, that Greek word that I just mentioned, which means to think differently, to orient our thoughts differently, to think in a different direction. So, proposition number four. Repentance requires change on our part, not God's part, our part, since God is the one that's right. Okay? And I think, again, that we can accept that proposition, that when if change is going to be involved, it's going to be us changing. Amen. So, here's the thing. When you, and Basically, what we're getting to here is we need to renew our minds to the Word of God. So let's look at uh, Romans chapter 12. It's always where I think about what I think about renewing the mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... And, and think about that. Think about the words he chose to use there. The word beseech carries with it the idea of begging. He's Think about how he's writing this. When Paul is writing to the Romans here. Brethren, I'm begging you by the mercies of God. I mean, he's serious about this. He says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, you, not God, you, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. As pastors pointed out, the Greek there says your spiritual service. But notice, you're the one that's doing the presenting. You're the one that's making yourself available. You're the one that's changing, that's aligning yourself with what God wants for us. And then verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world. See, this gets back to what I was saying about the world thinks we ought to be open-minded. Just accept what they say. Accept their ways. Accept their view of social issues. And, and that's what we need to do because we need to get along. And that's to be open-minded in the world's view. Well, here it says, don't be conformed to this world. To be conformed means I change to line up with the world system. Well, guess what? We're told explicitly not to change and line up with the world system. Don't be conformed to the world. But rather, be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind, there's that phrase, mind renewal, renewing of your mind, that, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God's will is good. God's will is acceptable. God's will is perfect. God's will is what we're after. Not the world's will. See, we don't want to get confused here. If we conform to the world and line up with the world, we're going to be in line with the world, but that's not going to be in line with God. God's thoughts are different. God's ways are different. So I want to line up with God. I posted on, the, on Facebook this week. I'd rather be biblically correct than politically correct. And very often, if you're biblically correct, you're not going to be politically correct. You're going to go crosswise of the world. And I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. But I'd much rather be in line with God than the world. So, renewing your mind to God's Word is renewing your mind to His will. Because God's Word is His will. There's a whole lot of people that are all frustrated and and upset and saying, oh, if I could just know the will of God. And they make it sound like it's impossible to know the will of God. But you know, the Scripture says that we should know the will of God. Matter of fact, we're expected to know the will of God. So how do we do that? We renew our mind to the Word of God, and the Word of God contains His will. The Word of God is His will. So if you have a question, for instance, about healing, What's God's will concerning healing? Go to the book. Find out what the Bible says. You know, people have a tendency to say, well, you know, my pastor said. Or they'll say, well, you know, my grandma said. Everybody's saying what somebody said, except what God said. <laughs> they need to go back to the book. You know, I like, again, what Keith Moore said. I love this phrase that he uses. He said, what do you need to be scriptural? Scriptures. And yet everybody's talking about healing. And oh yeah, God may put something on you to teach you something. Give me scripture. Show me an instance where Jesus came into town, laid hands on somebody and said, I'm going to make you sick to teach you something. Just one example. I'll just take one. There's not one. Everybody he laid hands on got healed. Yeah. You know, he, he preached to multitudes and, and multitudes would get healed. It looked like there'd be at least one or two in there that it wasn't God's will to heal. It looks like there'd be a couple that he'd say, it's not your time. Hold on, you've got to learn something here. No, there's not one example. So what do you need to be scriptural? You need scriptures. And so that's what it comes back to. If you want to be scriptural, go back to the Word of God. See what the Word of God says. Then 1 Corinthians 2.16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him. See, this gets back to that very issue I was talking about earlier. God's right. <laughs> There's no need to teach him anything because he knows it all. So who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we, Christians, have the mind of Christ. Now that's something the Bible says we have that I think we have fallen short of, let's say. We haven't been thinking with the mind of Christ. Well, how do you think with the mind of Christ? If our mind is renewed to God's Word, think about this. If our mind is renewed to God's Word, we can think with the mind of Christ because we know what He thought because He wrote it down. See, I love that about God. He wrote it all down for us. What's your will, God? I wrote it in my book. What should I do, God? I wrote it in my book. So if I renew my mind to the Word of God, I can begin to think like God thinks, think with the mind of Christ, because I'm reading what the Word of God says. I'm operating based on the instruction manual <laughs> that He left for us. So, James 1.5, If any of you lack wisdom, because really that's what it boils down to, in our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord, what we're really saying is, Lord, I need wisdom. I need to know how to operate here. I need to know what to say. I need to know what to do. I need to know how to live. So if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. And God's going to hold out on you. No, that's not what it says. 
It says, let him ask of God that giveth <clears throat> to all men liberally and upbraideth not. The word upbraid there is a good King James word. It means to find fault. Now, if anybody had a right to find fault, <laughs> it would be God. He could look at, at me and say, hey, you know, Bill, you, you, you need help, son. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got you got so much going wrong, you need to straighten up. But he doesn't find fault. He wants me to come to him openly, <clears throat> honestly, and say, okay, Lord, I need wisdom. How do I handle this bill? How do I handle this situation? And it says he will give to all men, so it's not even something limited Think about this. It's not even limited just to believers. He'll give information, knowledge, wisdom to all men liberally. First thing he's going to tell them if they're not born again is get born again, obviously. But the thing is, for us as believers, as children of God, we go to our Father God. He will give us wisdom liberally. He won't find fault, and it shall be given him. We've got that promise. So we can go to him and say, okay, Lord, what do I do? How do I operate in this? How do I do this? How do I live this out? Verse 6, though, says, but, this makes it conditional, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. If you are double-minded, you're not going to receive anything of the Lord. And I've had a lot of people say, oh, you know, Dr. Bill, I prayed. I asked God, but I didn't get it. Well, my first thought is, are you single-minded? Have you really studied out what the Word of God has to say about whatever that situation is? Have you got clarity on it? Do you have the knowledge you need? You know, faith begins where the Word of God is known. If you don't know the will of God, or the Word of God, I should say, if you don't know the Word of God, you don't know the will of God. If you don't know that, you don't know how to pray. You don't know how to stand on the Word. You don't know how to be uh, one who is not wavering. Because wavering comes from indecisiveness, un, you know, not making a, a decision, wavering back and forth between two opinions. Let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. Then verse 8 says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Now think about that, all his ways. And that's, that's pretty sad. You don't got a shot <laughs> if you're unstable in all your ways. And if because you're unstable, you're wavering. And because you're wavering, you can't expect to get anything of the Lord. You got problems. So what do we got to do? We got to get a hold of the Word. We've got to renew our mind. And once we know that we know, that we know that we know, well, I mean down in your knower, <laughs> you know that you're the healer of the Lord. You know that Jesus bore your sicknesses. He carried your diseases. By His stripes we were healed. If we were healed, I am the healed. Once you know that deep down, you begin to confess it out of your mouth because it's down there in abundance and it begins to come to pass in your life. I mean, you know, you've heard me tell the story time and time again about how I got out of the hospital. They had me dead, had a week to live, told me you were going to ship your saddle home, you're done. And I went home, but I said, I'm going to live and not die because I'm the healer of the Lord. And I began to confess the word, stand on the word. I had people praying. I had pastor laying hands on me. I had all kinds of, of good support. And I came out of that, and I'm alive today. It's some almost six years now, five to six years, uh, that I've been well and, and healed and whole from that situation of almost dying. And there have been others, many, many, many others, that have been healed. Well, what's the difference? They got to where there was nothing wavering. They got to where they knew that they knew that they knew. And it's the same thing concerning finances. It's the same thing concerning every area of life. God wants us blessed. He wants us so blessed, we haven't even begun to ask or think the kind of blessing He wants to give us. 
But we've got to be fully settled, fully single-minded on His Word and know what the Word of God says. And then finally, proposition number five. You can avoid instability and defeat by becoming single-minded on the Word. Now, that's pretty much a, a thought that comes out of what we've already studied out here. You can avoid this instability. You can avoid the wavering. You can avoid defeat by becoming single-minded on God's Word. You don't take the world's word for it. In my case, you don't take the doctor's word for it. I mean, there I was. I had all kinds of doctors, multiple doctors from multiple hospitals telling me, you're done. <laughs> you, you, you just get ready. This is it. Well, now, I could have bought into that. Matter of fact, I came pretty close to thinking, well, you know, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Not so bad necessarily, but I, in my heart, I knew that I knew that I knew I had things to do. I had places to go. I had preaching to do. I had all kinds of ministry activities that I was involved in. Who's going to keep the Word of Faith radio stations running? Who's going to keep Speak Faith TV running? Who's going to keep all that going? I have to hang around. Amen. And the Lord was basically indicating, you got things to do. I'm not done yet. Amen. So I said, well, if I'm not done yet, I better get on the stick here <laughs> and believe God. And that's exactly what it did. But I had to become single-minded on the Word. And then Matthew 7, 14. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way. This gets us to our title, <laughs> becoming narrow-minded. Narrow is the way which leads to life. And few there be that find it. You know, I was I was thinking one time listening to Brother Keith Moore. I love to listen to Brother Keith. It just ministers to me a lot. He's a good old country boy, and he just makes it plain. You know what I'm saying? And, of course, he comes out of Raymond, Brother Hagin's ministry. And, uh, you know, a lot of times listening to him teach is like listening to Brother Hagin teach because that, that anointing is rubbed off on him. But uh, he'll, he'll get to sharing and talking about the Word. And he will say, you know, he'll stop. He'll say, you know, we are in a vast minority of believers, of Christians in the world that believe in healing, that believe it's God's will to heal, that believe that God wants to prosper us, that really believe what the Word of God promises. We're in the minority of people. There are millions, and he'll, he'll talk about this, there are millions of people that don't believe this. Well, if they don't believe it, and they're wavering on it, and they're not single-minded on it, then it doesn't work for them. And it affirms to them, yeah, this stuff just doesn't work. I tried that faith stuff. You don't try faith stuff. And one of the few things that Yoda said <laughs> that is actually right is do or do not. There is no try. <laughs> you don't try faith. You do it. And in order to do it, you've got to have it built down in your spirit in abundance. And so, straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leads unto life, and few there be that find it. There's a whole lot of folk missing out on the blessings of God. It's unfortunate because it's available to all. It's available to anybody that will study the Word and receive from the Word. It's available to the entire body of Christ. It's our inheritance. It's our birthright. I have a teaching on my website that I did many years ago called uh, Healing Our New Birthright. New birth. Our new birthright. And see, that's the thing. We, as being born-again believers, we've got the birthright that God's given us of healing, of prosperity, of blessing, of wisdom, of all the things that He's provided for us. But we have to take advantage of it. And in order to do that, we've got to renew our minds to the Word of God. So, it is okay to be narrow-minded if you're right. <laughs> Amen? And see, that's the thing about God. God is right. He can afford to be narrow-minded. And if we study the Word of God and receive from the Word of God and build the Word of God into our spirit, 
and think with the mind of Christ and align our worldview with God's worldview, then we're going to be right because we're going to be in line with God. Again, I like something Brother Moore was talking about. I, th- I don't remember exactly who said this originally, but he, he quoted him. He said, always be on God's side. When the world is talking one way or another way or other Christians are saying this or that or the other, always take God's side. And that's just good advice. Always take God's side. I'm always going to line up with Him. I'm always going to line up with the Word. I'm always going to be a hard head about being in line with the Word of God. I'm not going to change if I know the Scripture says a certain thing. That's what it says. And there's nothing anybody can do about it. It is written. It is done. (laughs) Amen? And so I don't have to be concerned about being politically incorrect because there are a lot of things that God's not very politically correct about, but He is correct about it (laughs) because it is right. Amen. So hopefully, these are just a few thoughts that I wanted to share with you. And uh, hopefully you can see now where I was coming from when when I made the statement, we need to stay in a constant state of repentance because if we're going to go only our way, and when I say our, I'm talking about as individual humans, that haven't renewed our mind to the Word. If we're going to go our way, then we're probably going to be off in a wrong direction. We're all going to be off track. So if I repent, change my mind, get in line with the Word of God, get in line with God Himself and His worldview, then by staying in that state of, okay, God, wherever you say goes, then I'm going to be right, and I can afford to be narrow-minded. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of this? Oh, yeah. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. I trust you did. And uh, we'll go ahead and receive uh, the offering tonight. If uh, anybody needs an envelope, Cap will help us with that. If not, then we can use our uh, electronic means. I like using that, the square cash, to uh, give to Faith and Victory Church still until that changes over to the new name of Expedition Church at Triad. It'll still be Faith Victory Church in Square Cash. And then donations at fbc.org for PayPal. Either one of those is fine, and you can contribute to that. Those of you online that are watching tonight want to do that, then we would greatly appreciate it, and we'll put it into the gospel. Hallelujah. So let's pray over that. Father, we thank you for this offering tonight. We receive it by the Word of God, by prayer. We thank you, Father, that... All of the finances that come in will go directly into the ministry to bless and help the growth of Expedition Church of the Triad, the mission of Expedition Church of the Triad. And Father, will be a blessing to the people as they give in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, praise the Lord. Trust you as I say that you enjoyed that. We'll uh, pick up again Sunday. Pastor will be back. And uh, Sunday morning, 1030, right here at Expedition Church of the Triad. And remember until next time to fulfill the Word of God.